Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. Change. The seven power keys for planning change. I'm going to specifically zero in on the seven planning principles of Jesus. The seven planning principles of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gave us one of the most powerful but yet simple principle of understanding the power and the process of planning change. I'm going to move very quickly, so you need to write fast. The most important force on earth are time and change. And this is the focus of our series this year. The most important and powerful forces on earth are time and change. Because these are the only things that are guaranteed in life. Everybody have to deal with time. They must deal with change. And so the key in life is how do you handle time and change? That will determine what happens to your life. So here's my introductory focus. The key to kingdom success on earth is initiating and planning the change. Change will happen with or without you. Time will move with or without you. So these two elements must be managed. And the only way to manage these two and to be successful is to manage time and change. Success, therefore, is always in your hands because everybody has to deal with both time and change. These two things are given to everybody every morning. Time and change. Nobody is richer in time or poorer in time. Everyone has 24 hours every day. No one is richer in change or poor in change. Change is happening to everybody. Whether is dawn in this church or whether it is Donald Trump in the US, everybody faces change. So I want you to remember this. Your dream is only a dream until it has a plan. You can dream of the kind of life you want. You can dream of the kind of change you want. You can dream of the kind of future you want. But until you wake up and begin to plan to get there, it will only be a dream. So the secret to success in life, I'm going to give you the secret. Here it is. The secret to life is effective management of time and change. The principal key to management of time and change is planning. And planning is the most important principle of success in life. I want to prove that in this session. Planning is the most important principle of success in life. The only regulator of time and change is planning. Because without a plan, time and change will ruin your life. People are destroyed in life because they didn't choose the kind of life they wanted. You were created by God to live life not for life to live you. 
And the only way for you to live life is to control life. And life is simply changes through time. The moment you came from your mother's womb, the journey began. 2013 and 14 and 15 are years of massive changes in every sphere, both personal, corporate, and national. I think you're feeling it already. Nations are convulsing. They are changing. Massive changes in government, ideologies, philosophies. There's massive change in the economic systems and the formulas that we used in the past have become fruitless. There's massive change in religion where nations are being overran by other cultures and there's religious clashes everywhere. There's change in the communities that were isolated. They're being diluted by people coming in who never used to live in those countries. It's change. And so my admonition to you is one that I hope you will never forget as long as you live. And it is this statement, write it down. The only key to regulating and controlling change is planning. I will keep reinforcing that all during this session. Everybody say planning. planning. Young people, plan your life now. When I was 14 years old, I wrote my life's plan on paper because I began to read this book called the Bible. And I realized that the Bible was teaching me as a teenager that my life will be determined by the things that I planned for my life. And this is why I never had sex before I was married. I never drank alcohol, never smoked a cigarette or a marijuana joint. I never took any kind of substance to destroy my mind. I never dealt with girlfriends. And the reason was not because I was so holy. The reason is because I had something on paper that I kept comparing my decisions to. If you don't have a plan, you have no protection. A plan doesn't only tell you what you want to do. A plan tells you what you don't want to do. And so the key to success on your journey through this planet is to have a clear plan. So what are the first steps in this process of being successful in life? The most important response to managing time and change is planning. And God's strategy for guaranteeing your future is planning. There's a verse we read in our last session. I want to read it again. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. This statement tells me that God himself is a planner. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for your calamity, plans to prosper you and to give you what? A future and a hope. God says, I already know your future. I created it. But I also know that I need a plan to get you to your future. Even God knows that planning is a requirement for arriving to a destination. And so the, the purpose and the passion and the power of planning must be understood. I want to repeat this statement. God gave you a brain and the gift of imagination so that you could participate in creation through planning. No other animal on earth have the capacity to plan. Every creature God created 
lives on instincts. Instinct means they have a built-in ability to respond or react to circumstances. You and I can actually create the circumstances. So you are the only creature on earth that have the power to not live by reaction. You can design your response. And that is why I consider planning the highest expression of divine nature. God made you just like him. He can actually plan forever. That's why God is called the Alpha and the Omega. He already know the end because he planned it. He is called the beginning and the end because he planned the beginning and the end the same time. He has the capacity to do that. You can actually do that and you do do it and don't even know that you are different from a monkey or a dog or a cow or birds. They don't plan. They live by instinct. And this is why God commands you not to worship animals. These are instinctive creatures. There are some religions like Hinduism that really honor cows and, and creatures and these cows cannot plan. How can a creature with such power bow to beef on four legs? Don't you ever worship an animal. You are in the God class. The capacity to plan planning is what distinguishes you from the animal kingdom. And that makes you very important. Now please make a note of this then. A good plan is like a road map. It shows the final destination and usually it shows the best way to get there. Words of Stanley Judd. Very important. A plan doesn't just show you where you want to go. It also shows you usually the best way to get there. It is important for you to be able to change a plan than to not have a plan. Plans may change, but purposes are permanent. Your purpose is your destination. Your plan is the route to get there. If you wanted to go to the airport in your country right now, in your city, there are many roads to get there. I went to the airport yesterday to take my colleague, Dr. Morgan and his wife to the airport. And when I got to an area, there was an obstruction. They call it a detour. The detour did not cancel my trip. I simply had to go another way to get to the same destination. Life is that way. When you meet an obstruction, don't turn back. And that obstruction may be many things. Like getting pregnant because you made a bad decision out of wedlock. Don't kill the baby. Keep the baby and go another route. If your house burns down, that's a detour. Rent an apartment and call an architect. Don't commit suicide because your house burned down. Make another alternative plan. You cannot have a plan B if there is no plan A. And you can't have no plan A if you have no plan at all. So it's critical for you to understand that planning protects your life even from depression, from obstructions. Proverbs is a powerful book. When you want to read about planning, chapter 20, verse 18, write it down, please. It said, make plans by seeking advice. If you wage war, obtain guidance first. Make plans by what? Seeking advice. If you want to know who I am in your life right now at this moment, I am your advisor. And what I'm doing to you now is helping you to make a plan for your life. 
and for your business and for your family and for your marriage and for your future and for your career and for your education. Make plans, the word of God says, by seeking advice. And if you're going to go into a fight, he says, obtain guidance before you start. Write this down. Never pick a fight you can't win. Plan how you're going to win before you pick the fight. David did not go out to meet Goliath as an experiment. David practiced with that sling. Before Goliath met him, he became an expert slinger. So he walked out with confidence because he knew he's going to win this. Do you know how he knew? He knew that a man with a sword cannot stop a rock. So when you go out with your life in the morning, Monday morning, Tuesday morning, always go out with a confidence. This day is mine. Say it. Say it with passion. This day is mine. You got to wake up every morning that way. That means you got to already live the day before you start it. A plan is finishing before you start. Even your government, ministry of works in your country, won't allow you to start a house until you show them the finished house. Look at Proverbs 21 verse 5. The plans of the diligent lead to profit. As surely as those who rush into life leads to poverty. People without a plan will become poor. That's scriptural prophetic fact. In other words, we plan our poverty by not planning our profit. We are the way we are because we didn't think enough. There are people, for example, who retired but didn't have a plan after retirement. I don't know. Sometimes we think things just going to work out. Things don't just work out. They will work you out if you don't have what? A plan. You got to plan everything if you want that thing to be what you want. Now, I want to stress something here about success and failure. And this is Miles Monroe quote. Write it down. Whether you succeed or fail depends on the plan you have or don't have. I repeat. Whether you succeed or fail in life depends on the plan you have or don't have. And so success is waiting for a plan. Planning is more work than working. You spend more time planning in life than actually working the plan. This is why the Bible uses the word haste. You can't go into life hastily. You have to stop and think. Uh, let me show you what I mean about planning. I want you to get every statement here. I'm going to give you a definition of planning. Because some of you never found out what it is. Write it down. What is planning? Number one, planning is the management of the distance between your conception and your destination. Planning is, is the management of the distance between your birth and your death. Planning, therefore, has to do with that distance that is dynamic. Secondly, planning is applying purpose to time. Time is present anyhow. Planning is giving that time purpose, meaning. Thirdly, planning is documented preconceived determination of how time will be used. I want to break these words down very carefully. They seem big, but they're very small words. Planning is when you document a preconceived determination 
of how you will have your time used. Time is going to come anyhow. So what planning does is forces you to put on paper how you determine to use that time. You're telling time, you will be used for this. You ain't going to tell me what to do. I'm going to tell you what to do, time. And that's what planning is. Fourthly, planning is giving meaning to unused time motivated by a clear sense of purpose. I repeat, time and planning is giving meaning to unused time. You ain't used it yet. And that is motivated by a clear sense of purpose. You are going somewhere. For example, what will you do with tomorrow? It's unused at the moment. You ain't there yet. So my question is, what are you going to do with the 24 hours that begins at 12.01 tonight? Have you determined what that 24 hours will do connected to your life's purpose? Every day, this is Miles Monroe's habit, I always plan at least one thing that takes me toward my eternal destiny. Every day. I have many things to do, but I try to do one thing that moves me toward my assignment in life. Every day, at least one thing. It might be a phone call. It might be a, an email that I have to write. It might be meeting with someone who has information. In other words, you must have your time determined by your purpose. Number five, planning is regulation of time. You're regulating the time. Number six, planning is planning the use of resources. This is very important. Say it with me. Planning is planning the use of resources. Resources means your time, your energy, your talent, your gift, your relationships, your money, your, your house, your car, your fuel. How are you going to use them? Planning helps you to regulate that. Some of you have been driving your cars to places that ain't giving you no money. You spend the whole day driving around to meet people who can't help you. you misusing fuel. Think about it. The wear on your car tire is taking you to places, to people who are taking from you, not giving to you. That's abuse of resources because you didn't plan. If you had a plan, then every time you jump in your car, there's a purpose for the ride. There are people who drop in, and in on you. Tell them drop right back out. <laughs> Let me tell you something, friends. People call me, are you busy? I say yes. Sometime I know it is, that's okay, you got two minutes. Why? I ain't got a lot of time for you. I know you. Two minutes, say what you got to say. It can take more than two minutes, then you better see somebody else. Thank you. If you don't control your time, other people will. So planning is planning the use of your resources. And number seven, big time, write it down. Planning is taking control of your future. The next 12 months, who's going to control them in your life? The only way to answer that question is with a plan. You have to plan what are your major goals for 2013? What is your major goals for 2014? Listen, it's dangerous to live in limbo. Limbo is a serious country where nothing gets done. It's dangerous to live in that land where you don't know what to do. Some decisions you need to make are going to be very hurtful, going to be uncomfortable. But believe me, doing nothing this year is not an option. Planning helps you to fulfill the vision and the mission in your life. Write this statement down. The best way to predict the future is to invent it. 
You can invent the future with a plan. What I have become today, I planned it. What I like about God is when you make a plan, he will always exceed the plan. But if there's no plan, he has nothing to succeed. Let me quote something from God written by the Apostle Paul. He says, my God is able to do exceeding abundantly above, far beyond all, watch my lips, you can ask, think, or imagine. Three things you got to do first. In other words, if you haven't asked for anything, you haven't thought of anything, and you haven't imagined anything, then God ain't got nothing to succeed, to exceed. Stop asking God for a plan. Give him one. I'm going to show you that in a minute from the Bible. The power of planning is so important. This is Miles Monroe Vintage. <laughs> that means this is an original one. Write this down. If life was a bow and you were the arrow, then planning would determine the direction and the destination of your life's flight. If life was a bow and you was the arrow, the plan would determine what direction you go in and what destination you arrive at. Planning is that powerful. And may I say, life is a bow. And when you arrived here, you are the arrow. The Bible says children are like arrows in a quiver. You arrived here as an arrow. And life grabbed you and says, okay, which direction should I point you? I don't know. Okay. Life is asking you for direction and destination. Show me where you want me to go, life says. Where do you want me to shoot you with all this power I have of energy and time and change? Show me where I should send you. Give me something to work with because if you aim at nothing, you will always hit it. And this is the power of stopping and making a plan. Isaiah 32 says, the noble man devises noble plans and by noble plans he stands. Isaiah chapter 32 verse 8. But the noble man devises noble plans and by noble plans he stands. The word stand has to do with bearing up under pressure, disappointment, attacks, criticism, misunderstanding, abuse, corruption, hate, jealousy, deceitfulness. He says if you have a plan, you can handle all of that. Because you know, no matter what happens around you, you know exactly where you are going. If you don't have a destination, then any road will take you there. And sometimes people will drag you through alleys. Your plan will protect you, young man, from people abusing your life. Plans give you patience. You go to your job tomorrow and these people are treating you with disdain. And you know they have problems with you and they talk about you. Listen, you go there because you know this is not your permanent address. So you can buy them lunch while they curse you, take them for dinner while they gossip about you, and smile with them and say, look, it doesn't matter what you do, I'm just passing through. And most of the people who are in that environment trying to destroy you, they've been there so long, you're going to leave them there. And that's why they are, they're so grouchy. They're tired of being nothing. 
Don't allow anyone to control your life. And the way you protect yourself is to have a plan, it says. It makes you stand. Plan is the greatest act of faith. And this is very important. The greatest act of faith is planning. Why? Because we are never commanded to live by hope. Hope is good. But hopeful people are always broke. I got hope one day that I'll be on my own house. No wonder why you're still renting. I got hope one day that I'll start a business. That's why you're still working. I have hope one day that I'll be married. That's why you ain't married because you got so much hope you don't meet nobody. <laughs> Listen to me. Hope is wonderful, but hope is empty. The just are not supposed to live by hope. The just shall live by what? Faith. And the highest form of faith is planning. That means you believe something, you start planning to get there. Very important. I want to remind you of this from a quote that I saw by Gordon Hinkler. He said, you cannot plow a field simply by turning it over in your mind. <laughs> Write that down. That's a good one. There are people who have been thinking for 20 years about what they would like to do. And they keep thinking and thinking and thinking. And then what happens is they meet someone who is doing what they were thinking of doing. And they're so stupid, they tell the person, I was thinking of doing that. <laughs> Stop thinking and make a plan. Turn your thoughts into a design. And this is how you control life. Planning is also not for heaven. Because in heaven, life is eternal. So let me read a statement you never saw before in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 10. And it says... Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. For in the grave where you are going, there is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. Take it, tell your neighbor, you better do it now. In other words, stop procrastinating now. Stop telling me you're going to do it five years from now. Stop telling me that one day you will do something. If you die today, you had no time to plan. And that's why you are here in this session today and those watching all over the world. God has sent me into your life, a simple man born in Bain Town in a village here to tell you, if you don't design your life, somebody will. How incredible it is. Planning without action is futile. But action without planning is fatal. Can I say it again? Planning without action is futile. But without planning, action is fatal. You can destroy yourself without a plan. And this is why, again, it's never too late to start planning for the future. Whether you are 16 or 61, you can plan right now the rest of your life. You've been wandering through life the last 45 years. You've been drifting and letting people tell you what to do. Uh, even your marriage is basically just, you know, kind of kind of just doing what, what, what people say you should do and how you should live. The culture has taken over your life and told you what to expect. Even you as, the, as a divorcee, they told you that once you get divorced, you can't have no life after that. Don't let, don't let the people give you your life. Take control. Plan your way out of your depression. People spend years worrying about who they should marry. That's a waste of time and thinking. Get busy and do something valuable. Let them meet you in a plan. Clap. Yes. 
It's dangerous to marry somebody who's looking for a mate. Dangerous. Why? They're being preoccupied looking. That means they had no time to develop themselves. Which means you got a deficit, not an asset. Mmm, buy the CD just for that one. People who are progressive and focused are attractive. People who are always praying at the altar, hanging around church all day, looking for God. <laughs> People run from them. Very important. Now, I want to show you something here. <laughs> if you don't have daily objectives for your life, you qualify as a dreamer. Zig Ziglar, win that one. That was a good one. Write it down again. If you don't have daily objectives in your life, that means you know what to do every day, then you qualify as a dreamer, that's all. And dreamers are always the people who sleep under bridges on cardboard boxes. Dreams don't change your life. Plans do. Plan your way into your dream. Because this is how you make life what you want it to be. Jeremiah, again. God says, I know the plans I have for you. I know them. Which means God has a clear picture of not only where you're going, but how he wants you to get there. Remember now, the plan is the distance between the beginning and the end. He created your end, that's your purpose, but he also says, I have a route to get you there. And that route has very little to do with the destination. It has more to do with preparing you for it. If you, God wants you to do something that will make you a billionaire, God knows he cannot give you a billion dollars. You ain't ready for that kind of money. So he got to create a plan to prepare you to handle a billion. And it might mean going through a pit, being sold into slavery, being lied on, being put in prison, and then they finally come and get you and give you a billion dollars. And now you can handle the stress of pressure. So much of what you're going through could be a sign that something big is on the way. So don't curse the darkness because the light is coming. Don't curse your poverty. As long as you got a plan, God's going to plan you right out of poverty into prosperity and people are going to be amazed at what God's going to do for you in the next 12 months. Listen, God is so good. Shout amen. Shout hallelujah. Planning is the key to unlock your future. Your future is behind a beautiful door of a dream. But to get through that door, you need a plan. And this is why we must understand the purpose for planning. Planning is the original reason for your existence. Proverbs 19, 21 says, Many are the plans in a man's heart, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. Which means that God has a purpose that's supposed to produce the plan. Don't plan until you know God's purpose for your life. So purpose is the destiny that began the journey and purpose is the end that caused your beginning. It is purpose that is your predestination. Purpose gives birth to your plans. So if you don't know where you're going, you, you don't know what to plan. So it's important for you to ask God this year, what is my purpose in my life? Why did you give me birth? Why was I conceived? What is my passion, my dream? What is this destiny you have for me? When you find that, then you make your plans to get there. And God says, I will take you to your destiny. There are many roads in life, and you and I have to decide, how do I go, where do I go? If you don't know where you're going, then any road is right. Let me say something very important. Just listen to me carefully, I beg you. I learned this when I was 16 years old, and it still guides me today. There's no wrong exit. Can I say it again? There's no bad roads in life. If you're driving down the highway, you will notice that there are many exits along the way. What's an, what, what is an exit? Come on, answer me loud. 
is where you get off. That's an interesting statement, get off. Which means that you are on something, right? Yeah. So exits take you off. Are there any bad exits on a highway? No, they're all good. That's why they built them. <laughs> so the exits are good. They're not bad. Why do you pass them is the question. Ah, now we're getting into some deep stuff here. Why would you pass something that's good? You would pass good things. All exits are good. And they lead to certain places. Nothing's wrong with an exit. But what makes you ignore them? You're so smart. What? Your destination. Write it down. Destination turns good things into bad things. If you know where you're going, you also know where you don't want to go. And if you don't have a plan, a destination, a purpose, people will keep telling you come through their exits. And you end up in towns you ain't belong. End up with people you shouldn't be associating with. Your greatest danger is sometimes your best friends are true or Ali. And you got to leave this highway of your life to keep company with people who ain't going nowhere. Life is not only measured by the things you do, but also by the things you don't do. Write this down. Good is not always right. That's the lesson. Highways are, exits are good, but they may not be right for you, depending on where your destination is. Planning, therefore, controls where you exit. So there are people who send me invitations, and I get hundreds of them every year. This year has been the worst of all. And I'm looking at these invitations go all over the world, and I gotta keep testing them against my assignment. My assignment is third world leadership training. So I gotta check these exits. You know, someone said, I want you to come and speak at my pastor's anniversary. No, 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 I can't do that, because that's not third world leadership training, see? So I write them back, thank you very much for your kind invitation, but it's not in keeping with my assignment in life. They say, I'll pay you $10,000. I don't care. You don't get it. It ain't money. It's my destination. Good is not always right. There are some good people around you who ain't right for you. They ain't bad people, you know, but they just come to suck up your time, suck up your energy, suck up your passion, suck up your thinking, and they contaminate you with all kind of gossip and stuff. You ain't got time for that. Do you have a plan? It protects you. What's the process of planning? Write it down, the process of planning. Let me give you a quote first. Our dreams may be real, but our plans give them breath. Our dreams may be real, but our plans give them breath. It gives them life. Dreaming, therefore, is not enough. I don't believe your dream until you give me a plan. Dreams are waiting for a plan. Proverbs 16, verse 1. I'm going to show you now very quickly the principle of planning. Proverbs 16 verse 1 says, To man belongs the plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the reply of the tongue. I want us to read this loud together. Will you please help me? Go. To man belongs the plans of the heart, uh, from the Lord comes the reply of the tongue. What does this statement mean? I did the research for you. Number one, write it down. It means to man belongs to plans. The human is responsible for making the plan, not God. Number two, the plans, it says, means that you are responsible for controlling time and change. You are, not God. Number three, it means the heart. The word heart here has 
nothing to do with your chest. The Hebrew word is mind. It means your mental intellectual faculties. It is in your mind, God says. I put the plan in your mind. God didn't give you a mind for you not to use it. God gave you a mind and intellect for his purpose. He wanted to use your mind to deposit in it spiritual destiny. It comes in your mind. Do you know why this is important? Because most of you have been taught you got to go and find God's will somewhere. And you've been looking for it all your life and can't find it. Do you know why you haven't found it? It's been in your head all these years. It's called ideas. Imaginations. These are gifts from God. God says, your plan is in your mind. And then the next way he says, he gives the reply of the tongue. I got to explain this. The Hebrew word here means God will explain how the plan will be executed and financed. Praise the Lord. This is good stuff right here. I love it. God says, you make the plans and don't explain to anyone how it's going to happen. That ain't your business. That's my business, he says. Why? Because sometimes the plan is so big. You ain't got the resources in your pocket. Now, this is an important thing. Let me tell you why. Because most people don't plan because they believe they have to come up with the resources. So they don't even start to plan. God says, stop it. Start. You walk in this place and in that lobby you see a display of buildings. Those buildings are about 98 to 100 million dollars that I'm planning to build. They're finished in my mind. That's why they are there in that display. Before you leave, you'll see them. The whole property here is already designed, planned. The first building is up. We got the paving in. We're moving. Listen, if I was trying to find if we could get a hundred million dollars before I started planning, I would never have a plan. So Dr. Monroe, how are you going to build the media center? How are you going to build the leadership center? Don't care, don't know. I gave God what he asked me for. Oh, come on, y'all. Wake up, use your brain. God says, if you don't give me a plan, you give me nothing to work for. Stop sitting down waiting on God to bless you. Attract it by giving him a plan. Let me tell you why also. God doesn't give resources for you to go on vacation and play golf. God don't give you resources to go shopping in Florida. God gives you resources to complete his covenant he made with you to finish your assignment he gave you. He pays for his assignment, not for your fancy vacations. Your plans are supposed to be in keeping with God's assignment for your life. And that's why he says, you make the plan and I will explain how it will be done. That's good news. What a powerful verse, huh? The second verse I want you to read and write down is Proverbs 12, verse 5. It says, same chapter, for the, th the thoughts of the righteous are right. Ooh. Now, remember I told you, where did God say the plans are? In your heart. Where's your heart? In your head. So now read this verse. The thoughts of the righteous, come on, read it, are right. Pause there, man. Don't rush through that. God says, look, <laughs> You've been thinking this thing all these last 25 years and you're still looking for my will. You've been praying and fasting and getting prophecies and traveling to prophet conferences and telling folks to prophesy to you, calling on phone, on TV, say, send me a prophecy. You are stupid. Forgive me. People are never supposed to run your life, including me. No prophet supposed to tell you what to do with your life. No, none of them. No prophet. The Bible says prophecy is for confirmation, edification, and encouragement. Write it down, please. Write it down. It's not for instruction. Prophets come into your life to affirm what you already know. 
They come to encourage you to keep doing what you already know you're supposed to be doing. They come to edify you, to keep you built up, to keep doing what you know you're supposed to be doing. You don't go to prophets to get no instruction. God says, I give my plan in your thoughts. You know, young man, I look at you today. You're such a gifted actor. And one day you stopped me, young man sitting there. And he said, Pastor Miles, this is what I want to do. I want to... I want to create a, 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 a company that produces movies. You don't need no prayer for that. If it's in there, I won't go away. That's what you're supposed to do. Let me say it again. If it's in your mind and it won't go away, that's God. Can I suggest to you that your mind is a womb? Your mind is a womb. And a thought is a sperm. And God wants to impregnate you in your mind with his thoughts about why you were born. And when you produce what you produce, they call it your brain child. iPhone, Stephen Jobs' brain child. Can a brain have children? You know what's wrong in our own country, the Bahamas? We are barren in our brains. Our government cannot conceive new ideas anymore, it seems. When you start adopting old babies, <laughs> interpret that, if you will. And that means that you are infertile. You were sent to earth like a womb. Because God has a baby he wants you to bring forth. And he puts it in your mind, he says. And he says, if you've been thinking it all these years, it is right. Stop looking for prophecy. This ministry didn't start from no visitation, from no angel and no prophet. I had an idea. That's all. And the idea never left me. And then I met Pastor Richard and he had the same idea. And then I met Pastor Henry. He had the same idea. I met Pastor Dave. He had the same idea. I met Pastor Jay. He had the same idea. And we decided, you know something? This idea won't leave any of us. Let's do it. Today, we are reaching millions of people around the world. What are you waiting for? What do you dream about from the Philippines? What, just think about it. Your culture tells you all you can do is keep somebody's house. And God says, no, that's just temporary. He sends you away to isolate you so you could think. He hides you in someone's house so you can't be interrupted. So you can hear his voice and his thoughts can impregnate your mind. At the food store, I said, I was checking out and a young man was packing the bag. And I said, you know, son, you know, he was so overwhelmed, you know, that I was there, you know, the young man was, he said, I saw you on TV. I said, yes, I'm the guy on TV. I said, you know, I used to do this. I used to pack bags in city meat market. He said, you used to, I said, yes, I worked four years packing bags after school in a food store. All of a sudden he changed. He said, you mean if you pack bags, you'll become like you? I said, absolutely yes. Give God a hand for a wise young man. Where you are is not permanent. Measure your life not by your present condition, but by the condition of your thinking. What's in your brain? What does God put in your mind? What do you have in your heart? That's where God says you're going. Tell him I'm going there. I'm going there. I'm going there. That's what God has for you. He says the plans of a righteous man are what? Right. 
He says, so don't get counsel from who? The wicked and the deceitful. Now the word deceitful is important here. Some people, if you tell them what's in your mind, their deceitfulness will cause an abortion or miscarriage. They will destroy your dreams with their tongue. They'll poison your baby with their language. Who do you think you are? That will never happen. You ain't from the right family. You ain't got no money. You ain't got no connections. You ain't got no the right relationships. Your skin wrong. Your nose too big. They tell you everything. They are deceitful. What they want you to do is to be just like them. They ain't doing nothing. Stay away from the counsel of the wicked and protect your baby. Oh, my brother-in-law, you got to watch that. You got to say, God, keep me in the right environment. Sometimes in a board meeting, you got to protect your thoughts. Because even board members can start throwing stuff out in the meeting. And it starts eating away at your dream. And you got to protect yourself by talking to yourself. Sometimes you're in a group of investment and the people start talking what can't happen. You got to start thinking, but I got to protect this dream. Yeah. Sometimes you got to cut off a relationship or, or you have to actually cut off a contractual agreement with someone because they are now thinking negatively. Listen, write this down, Proverbs 12 verse 5. The same verse, it says, the plans of the righteous are just, but the advice of the wicked is full of deceit. Deceit means I have a plan in my mind for you to destroy you. That's deceitfulness. I have a, an alternative plan that I didn't tell you about. And even though I may tell you something positive, I'm really trying to get you to do something negative. I'm trying to destroy you. That's deceitfulness. It's called misrepresenting yourself. There are people who ain't, they don't mean you any good. And so it's so important for you to watch yourself. Divine partnership in planning. I love this one. Proverbs 3. Now the next verse is powerful. God says, commit to the Lord whatever you do and your plans will succeed. Say amen. I love that. I love it. I love it. God says what? Commit to me whatever you plan to do and your plans will succeed. Watch this. And the Lord will work out everything for his own end. God said, I'm going to make this successful for my reputation. Tell your neighbor this year, God's going to be proud of me. I'm going to give him something to do. And he's going to finish it and get the glory. Shout hallelujah. Clap your hands. Is that right? He said, I'm going to do it for my sake. I'm going to give you success so I can look good, he says. I'm going to do this for me. But first, you got to present the plan. That's why I don't worry about this ministry. I really don't. I tell God, this don't work. You embarrass, not me. I can soon leave the earth and they can still talk about you. <laughs> he said, I will do it for who? For his own ends. Let me give you what this means right down very quickly. Number one, it means commit to the Lord. means to submit your plans to the passion and purpose in your heart that you have to God. Number two, to the Lord works that everything means that the Lord is responsible for the provisions, the resources, and the direction of your plan that you gave him. He is responsible for what? The provisions, the resources, and the direction. He says, leave that to me. It also means his own ends. That means that the plan must fulfill God's ultimate purpose on earth, not your personal ambitions. Any plan that is from God will never profit only you. It'll profit humanity. Yes. Yes. And that's how you measure where the plan is from God. Yes. If you have an idea to build a big house and own a big yacht and have a nice car, that's not a plan from God. That's ambition. If you have a plan to build a business, to change the world and hire people and help families, that's from God. All of God's plans benefit humanity, not just you. So don't confuse ambitions with plans. Very important. What's the process of planning? It's the last verse in Proverbs 16, verse 9. It says, in his heart, the man plans his course. 
but the Lord determines the steps of that plan. This is a powerful one. Keep this close to you. Get the CD just for this. Those of you watching online, I must quote it for you very carefully. It says, in his heart, man makes the plans and the Lord directs the steps of that plan. Here's what it means. First, heart means what? You are responsible for using your mind to make the plan. Stop praying for God to give you a plan from heaven. Sometimes we seem to be waiting for God to drop something on our bed in the morning. And say, oh, there it is. Hallelujah. God says, no, you sit down and use your mind and put what's in your brain on paper. In your womb, I put an idea. Put it in a document. Even though it seemed to cost three billion dollars, that's not your problem. That's my problem. And look at the, the next word. He says, the Lord determines. The word Lord means owner, which means he owns the plans. You're just the manager. You're the steward. If he gave you a plan, then that's his responsibility. So he owns all the problems in it, all the needs of it, and therefore your job is to produce it, and he's supposed to make it come reality. Determines the steps means that he designs the process, the timing, and the guidance. These are important. Write this one down. You have a plan. God determines the steps. Pastor Miles, why haven't we built the next building yet? Don't know. That ain't my problem. When the time comes, it's going to fall into place. He determines what? The steps. And the thing it is, the next phase of this project may not even be mine. It might be the next leader who takes over after us. You see, God determines the timing. God spoke to Adam and Eve when he spoke to the devil. He says, the seed of the woman is going to come and bruise your head. That seed didn't show up until 4,000 years later. He determines the timing. But you got to have a plan. Otherwise, he has nothing to do. Is this good stuff? So I want to close on the seven principles of Jesus. I, I want you to get this because we need to understand how Jesus thought. Jesus came to earth, and here's what he says. He gave us seven principles. Now, I'm going to go to this very carefully because I want you to get them. You never saw this before. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus gave us a seminar on planning. And here's what he says. He says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and then estimate the cost to see if he can have enough money to finish it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, anyone who sees it will ridicule and laugh at him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. <laughs> These are the words of Jesus Christ. You think God wants to work miracles in your life. I want to build a tower. Bam! Name of Jesus, tower built. He said, no. God don't work that way. I want to go to college. I believe God for money. No, it don't work that way. I want to start a business. God told me to start a business. I see the business. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So God, didn't just give me a favor. I go into the bank with a plan. Hallelujah. And God said, no. Let me read it again. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. This is Jesus talking. Will he not first? Everybody say first. first. I can't hear you. First. Will he not first? The first thing is not to build a tower. The first, you cannot even tell anybody about it. Let me break it down for you because you're looking at me strange, all right? First, he says, if you want to build a tower, that means, do you have a clear picture of what you want? Do you have a clear image of your destiny? He said, first, you got to have a clear vision of where you want to go, young man. He said, you got to have a clear vision, young woman. Where you want to go? First, get the vision. Don't start letting them tell you know where you're going. He says, get a vision first. The second step, number two, is first. First means the priority in life is not to do the thing. But the first thing is shocking. He said, sit down. We got 12 months ahead of us. 
And what I'm doing by God's instruction is telling us, sit down, God says. Don't go into this year rushing about what you want to do. He says, stop first, stop first. And he said, sit down. Sit down means stop, think, get quiet, meditate, get away from the noise, lock up in the closet, stay away from your family and your children and get God's ideas. Stop. We are so busy doing things that make no sense that by the time we realize we ain't done nothing, we are tired. Plan your energy by first stopping. Third principle, he says, estimate. He uses the word. Estimate means use your imagination and see the projects, assess things, predict what could happen. They call it in business, you know, a SWOT. You got to do an analysis of what are your strengths and what your weaknesses are and what it's going to take to get things done, how much it might cost and what you might lose and what you might face, what might happen to the economy, what might happen to the government, what might happen to the policies. You got to estimate everything, he says, estimate. Now, it doesn't mean that he ain't going to interfere, you know. But he says, go in there with your head on and your eyes wide open. Jesus said, estimate. Fourth principle of planning, he said, the cost. Everything you plan to do will cost you. And that cost may be not just in the price of it, but the impact it could have on your life and your family life. Also, the demands it will make on you and also the cost of it mean to your energy, your body, your focus, your time, your, 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 your intellect. Your cost may also mean friends. You might lose. Are you willing, he says, to count the cost for this plan? And he said, do it before you get up. <laughs> you know, when I, when I began this work, this ministry, people thought I was crazy. And, you know, and you know, it's amazing. Some of my family didn't understand me. My own brothers and sisters didn't understand me. I thank God for my father who's here today. My father and mother used to say to me, they said, son, I'm, this, 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 they told me that, they said, my son, we, we don't know what you're doing, but we believe God is with you. Do it anyhow, son. I thank God for good fathers and mothers, man. I mean, other people are skeptical, you know, why are you leaving your daddy's church? I had to leave my father's church. Boy, you know, you grew up in that church all your life. You know, yeah, you know your name on a bench kind of thing, you know. And I'm like, you know something? You don't understand. That, that church is not my destiny. Don't ever make a church your destiny. Now my father's here. Stand up, daddy. My daddy's taking notes from me now. Look at this. He got his pen, his notebook, and he's 88 years old. Thank you, dad. See, praise the Lord. He's so glad. He's glad his son didn't obey him with that church. Ain't nothing wrong with the church, you know. But your destiny takes you away from some churches. You better clap right there. You, you, your future may not be where you were born. Can I hear an amen? So it will cost you even your family relationships. When you have a plan, people don't like you anymore. Because they ain't got none. And they want company. It will cost you. And number seven, number six rather, he says, make sure you have what? Enough. This is important. Sit there and calculate before you start. Every project that I do, I sit down and calculate. Sometimes I, I would tell my board, I say, look, I'm going to do this. And I say, don't worry about the money. Why? I got that covered already. When I announce something to you, I got that figured out. Why? He told me, I got to check, see if I have what? Enough. That takes thinking, imagining, 
You haven't used your brain for so long. If you start doing what I'm doing, you'll have a headache. Your brain is so crusted over. You have, you have not been able to think of new ways for a long time. The shoe you have on now is your favorite shoe. You ain't got no other shoe. You, you, why? You don't want to think but no other shoe. Just a shoe. Boom. Shoe. Your hairstyle, you need to change it, man. Same old hairstyle. Boom. Just put on a hair cloth, go to sleep, wake up, take it off. Hey! Do something that makes you want to think differently. Shout hallelujah. Amen. When you come to church next week, take another route. Go to highway. Cut, go early so you can see some new scenery. Just do something that makes you change and give an account and say, Lord, it's going to cost me a little bit more fuel, but at least I have a better view. Life. Sit down and calculate, he says. Do you have enough? Now, this is amazing. This is Jesus talking, which means he don't want you experimenting with your faith. You make sure you calculate the best you can, even whether you can finish something, he says. Then he says, give it to me. Commit it to me afterwards. Let me tell you a figure about God. People, listen to me. This, I'm giving you so many secrets in my life. God says, don't ever give me an open figure. This is important. We say to God, God bless me. God's saying, with what? Give me something. Why? Lead me to where? I need some money. For what? See, you, and then God said, and, God said, and how much you need? I always, you know, I don't know if, if, if uh, my pastors, you know, sometimes they don't, they don't learn, you know, watch me. Do. I never, when I get up, I don't ever say, give me some money. I, I have a target. I need $4,000 from 10 people. Why? I don't calculate. You need a target. Give God a target. Enough means, that means you know when that's enough. There's, a, there's an end, there's a figure. God, here's the building. Now you better build it. God says, you haven't told me how much this building gonna cost, what it's gonna take to furnish it, how it's gonna be upkept, what will the maintenance cost for five years. Give me the whole thing, he says. Let me see what's enough. And then he says, I will give you exceeding. But first, you got to give me something to exceed. I want to build a house. God said, okay, fine. So, what kind of house you want? Don't know yet. God said, then you're going to be renting right now. How much house is going to cost? I don't know. God said, then I guess I don't know what to give you. Am I coming through, y'all? See, you need to spend this whole week and just stop. Go straight home from work, lock the door, shut down the phone and say, I have stopped. First, what's the first one? Stop. Calculate, estimate. Number seven is beautiful. He says, and see if you can complete it. God wants you to finish things. Finish your phase of it. Complete your assignment in it. You want to be like Jesus Christ who estimated the cost of dying on the cross. The Bible says about Jesus, Behold the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the earth. And then it says that he was able to handle the pain and the stress because of the joy that was set before him he could endure the cross the plan kept him enduring the pain because he already have count the cost the cost was sealed in Gethsemane when he told God this cup is gonna hurt me but not my will he said I'll take it I count the cost but thine be done. I'm going to drink this cup in the garden. Not when I get on the cross. I drink it now, he said. So it doesn't matter. I already count the cross. And that's why he could say to them, Father, forgive them. Because they're just part of the program. Getting it done. Let me close with this. He gave 
a final example. He said, suppose a king is about to go to war. Jesus speaking, and another king, he's going to fight. Will he not first, what? Sit down, same instructions, and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000. If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still along the way off and will negotiate terms of peace. Jesus is talking about planning now. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything, he has, cannot be my disciple. He kicks it into their negotiating to follow him even. Now look at his thinking. This one is interesting. Seven steps. One, he says, if you go to war. War means if you are going to fight to get something in life, if you're going to fight for the rights of other people, to help them be free from oppression, if you're going to fight for justice for other people, if you're going to fight to achieve something to help humanity, he says, first, you must sit down, stop all your activities, withdraw and isolate yourself and think it through and consider. That means he wants you to study it and dream about it and focus on it and get details and put it on paper. And then he says, and check how much the other guy has who's against you. What are your odds? What do you have to fight to make this happen? Assess the resources and the resistance. When God spoke to us for this year and he said, I want this ministry to bring kingdom leadership to transform society. I told you the first day of this year, I told you I was afraid because I already know the cost of that. You will hear your pastor's name almost every week now. Because when you step out, you're going to be on every radio station, every television station, all the newspapers have your name. They're going, to, they're going to come against you. But he says, I am with you. And if God be with you with an assignment, who can be against you? You're going to become victorious. But I count the cost. 10,000 against 20,000. What is your resources? And then he says, if you see that the resources ain't enough, he says, don't fight. Negotiate. <sighs> Listen, you owe the bank four years back mortgage or maybe a year back mortgage. He says, don't avoid their telephone calls. Go in while they are still on the way. At least they're still calling you, he says. They ain't send the cops. He says, and go in and sit with them. He says, and what? He says, and negotiate with them. Sometimes victory comes from negotiation. Negotiating is not compromise. Negotiation is reasoning for your advantage. Your enemy is not the creditor. Your enemy is the fact that you ain't going to talk to them. You need to make an appointment this week and go and talk to someone you owe money to and say, look, I just ain't got it. And explain to them and tell them, but now here's my plan. I got a plan to pay you back. By 2014, September, I should have this done. Give them something. Don't just drive on the other side of the street and duck through another alley. You're creating more enemies and bad reputation for Jesus. He said, make a plan even when the odds are against you. Look at the conclusion he gives. Eh? He, I like the conclusion. He says at the end, he says, ask them for terms of peace. In other words, you want peace for these people. Here you are in this church, you owe people money, and you keep ducking through the side door, ducking through the side door. That's not peace. That's, that's unrest. You got stress. You're causing yourself sickness. And the person you owe money to ain't going to kill you. They can't kill you. Because they want the money. <laughs> what, what, what did Jesus say? Negotiate terms. People ain't stupid. They know you broke. You lost your job. Ain't got something. Hey, in other words, the number one thing in life is to be honest. Honesty means, look, 
You got 20,000, I got 10. I know I can't beat you. So listen, in our best interest, let's all live together. That's all he's saying. You share my farm, they share your farm. You got water, I got food. Let's, let's, let's trade. Instead of becoming enemies and kill each other. Stop running from things that are odds against you. If you obey Jesus, I'm telling you, he will begin to work miracles. The reason why he can't work in your behalf, because you're disobeying his command. He says, go and make terms first. And then give him a plan. Turns means let's have a plan. I have a plan to fix this. Then God says, okay, let me move now. And God will bring somebody from places you can't deserve. And he will give you all the money you need to pay off your mortgage in one day. But because you don't have even the plan, right? God's not going to to work with. Am I coming through? He says, take a delegation. Sometimes you got to share the vision you have with people. You, you can go to a bank that's antagonistic against you and explain your vision to the bank. And during the meeting, the bank will change their mind. Say, you know, some, we didn't know you were thinking that way. Sure, how much, how much, how much more do you need? Because they saw a delegation sharing a vision. I follow Jesus' instructions all the time. And it always works. He tells us how to plan. Finally, he says, ask them for terms. I'm quoting Jesus. I'm quoting Jesus. He says, ask them for terms. Why? Because you know they're bigger than you. Tell them, how do you want me to fix this? Let them tell you. Because sometimes, you know, what you have to say to them, they can't, you know, they, they can't accept. So you tell them, okay, then tell me what to do so I can make you happy. And then both of us win. Because if you're happy, I want you to be happy, not mad. Ask them for terms. What a plan. I can plan my way out of odds if I can plan the negotiation. I hope that this has been a great session for you. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.